Righty ho. So there we go. You know where to, to email me for links, slides, and information, and or go there. Right now, uh, you might have read something about Prince Michael of Kent this uh, this week, but the real problem with him, as far as I'm concerned, is he runs the Prince Michael of Kent Road Safety Awards, and you can read more about what I think is wrong with him uh, in my book. Um, this is the kind of thing you get, that gets Prince Michael of Kent Road Safety Awards. This was a um, telling uh, it, run by the Scouts, actually telling kids to always wear high vis uh, when crossing the road. And this was um, supported by the RAC and financed by Vauxhall Motors. Um, you know, that's your, that would normally get into your victim blaming tonight bit. Anyway, uh, I, uh, you should know about Prince Michael of Kent and his road safety awards. Okay, here's a big article came out this week um, from Rachel Aldred and colleagues. Uh, cycling behavior in 17 countries, levels of cycling, who cycles for what purpose and how far. And she says, only countries that have 7% plus cycling mode share have gender equity in cycling or close. Um, suggests that to get gender and age equity, lower cycling cities and countries need substantial relative growth in cycling. Um, so, for example, in London, still around 3%. It's not surprising that so far gender balance hasn't equalised. This is a log graph, and uh, you know, here you have the Netherlands, pretty close gender equity. Uh, with a mode share of 30, and then you get less gender equity going right down through all the places like Chicago, which have a low mode share for cycling. Nice graphic from Lisa Hopkinson of Transport for Quality of Life. Road schemes increase carbon in multiple ways, and uh, you can see that it's not just induced traffic, it's higher speeds, embodied carbon and land clearance. Uh, so now we're moving on towards the elections. Uh, I think, you know, this could have happened, uh, this shot could have happened, that's uh, Prime Minister with Andy Street of Birmingham, except they wouldn't be wearing lids. You know, it just shows how out of place lids are for normal clothing. So uh, on the election, there's a nice thread from the Labour Walks and Cycles on Twitter saying, Labour candidates committed to making our streets healthier, safer and greener have done well in this election. So it's Andy Burnham, uh, who's been pushing uh, active travel. Uh, uh, Cowns also been talking about walking and cycling and so on. And um, so that's happened, but uh, for example, David Arditi pointed out that in Brent and Harrow, Harrow's taken out its cycle lanes, Brent's done more or less nothing, and they also returned Labour uh, candidates. Um, and in Southampton, as a Mr. Smith said, uh, we're going to get some of those ridiculous cycle lanes out. So it's gone even worse in Southampton. Uh, although in Oxfordshire, the Coalition for Healthy Streets and Active Travel have uh, talked about, uh, they've got a, quite a thread there saying that majority of votes are going to candidates, or a lot of votes going to candidates again, agreeing with key active travel policies. Um, and uh, this is a graphic from Leo Murray of Possible in London. Uh, just showing how first past the post makes things worse in that uh, the anti-cycle lane guy in Kensington, Chelsea, Council of Devonish, uh, just beat the uh, Labour candidate uh, who liked cycle lanes plus the Green and Lib Dem. Who, and so uh, more candidates like cycle lanes than the person who uh, sort of mo more votes for candidates who like cycle lanes than the person who got elected who hate cycle lanes and i did have flashed this quote up a couple of times before and 
it, it does show that Khan won, uh, albeit by not quite as big as the majority as uh, was flagged up beforehand, uh, pushing the fact that he wants individuals to be walking slightly and using public transport. So we could possibly say that the election, to some extent, has been a positive uh, referendum for LTNs and cycle lanes. We could perhaps, but we'll go into that in a bit more afterwards. Um, in London, uh, Sadiq Khan didn't actually sign the document the London Cycling Campaign wanted him to, um, uh, uh, unlike the Green and Lib Dem candidates, and of course is still pushing ahead with road building through the Silvertown Tunnel. And uh, Ashok of LCC saying, we're pleased that he's responded to LCC, but disappointed he hasn't accepted our logic that achieving zero carbon roads needs to happen by 2030. And we'll press him to bring forward his outdated 2041 target for ending avoidable car use. Uh, all based on the climate emergency. Interesting that uh, the pushing for uh, measures with regard to climate change has come to a large extent from a small charity named the Green Side of the Campaign. Uh, now, this is something uh, that you should read from Phil Goodwin. In an article uh, by um, Carlton Reed on suggesting the government will be scaling back the roads program. And he said it would make sense to review it and uh, as a whole and also by individual scheme. They were originally appraised on the assumption of high rates of traffic growth indefinitely in the future, which should now be recalculated with re reference to the geographical effects of Brexit, travel patterns triggered by the pandemic, and the effects of the policies which will be necessary to meet new carbon targets. Uh, it's a good time to carry out such a reappraisal to make sure that large amounts of money are not wasted on inappropriate infrastructure. And he also refers to the review of the Green Book. Um, and these are all your nice arguments put together against the roads building program as it stands. Um, there's uh, new stuff to read. Uh, this is all stuff I had up last week, so I'll just skate all over that. Um, I mentioned that before, the 10 reasons for failing the driving test uh, and the new target in Lord slash emissions. This is new and compulsory reading. It's uh, not particularly long. It's a submission by various transport professors, Phil Goodwin, Gillian Annabel, Glenn Lyons, Greg Marsden, Graham Parkhurst on roads pricing and why it needs to come in and what's good about it and why it's required. It's uh, in front of a select committee. Uh, do have a look at that, absolutely compulsory reading. Um, just other stuff I, I did uh, last um, uh, last week. Here's the Carlton Reed article I just mentioned before. Uh, Sylvia Gotera got a, uh, an article on how uh, she uh, uh, got to use a cargo bike, um, take her kids around in London. Um, and don't forget Andy Cox's run for road piece. Uh, next week, uh, the seminar on viable 20 minute neighborhoods, webinar rather, and the other one I mentioned on doing research when it matters with Rachel Allwood and uh, chaired by Ian Walker. Uh, in the UK, in Northumbria, the police have been uh, seem to be doing some close passing work and uh, taking in third party reporting. Um, now in Newcastle, uh, some LTN uh, news where there's a, a sit down protest here uh, to defend some bollards, defending those bollards, uh, which are due to be taken out uh, because they want to preserve their low traffic neighborhood. So you, you can uh, read more on that thread there. Uh, Kirk Lees, yes. 
in Heckman White Town Centre, I'm afraid the guardrails go in and 30 mile an hour limit stays, whereas we should be getting down to a 20 mile an hour limit, uh, not have guardrails and not have a lot of central hatching either. Uh, the only school street in Kent is made permanent, according to Gary Utram. Uh, in London, there's an LTN in Tower Hamlets, which has gone in. Uh, in Camden, uh, great to see the York Way cycle route now extend to Camden Park Road, 24 hour bus lane, prote protected bike lanes, kind of interesting design. It's not a, a um, uh, a, a floating bus bus stop with the cycle lane going behind the bus stop. Um, it's a bit more like the original Royal College Street uh, arrangement. And I've got these three slides which I brought up last week. You should go and look at the road traffic estimates in Great Britain and see um, what happened last year and uh, what it might mean. Just flick through those. Right now, a shock slide for you. Can you mute yourself and then um, just speak afterwards? Okay, the horror. Here's a shock slide. Uh, you may be a bit upset by this, but I know you're all steely. So here we go. This is from America. And of course, it is pretty shocking. Yet again, a kid being put on a bike with stabilizers. Uh, we've told them about this so many times. You need to have a balanced bike to start off with, otherwise it won't make it so easy to get to ride bicycles. If you don't ride bicycles, you will uh, be more likely to drive a car. And as you know, in the United States, if you exclude the suicides, um, more people are killed by cars than, uh, or in road crashes, than uh, are killed with guns. So, yeah, that's what we mean by risk analysis. I can say a lot more about that actually, because it's in fact, the, it's quite interesting how low the number of deaths in road crashes are, are in the United States since there are very small numbers of people uh, walking and cycling compared to motoring. Right. Uh, this is a little um, from an exhibition in Paris. There's a guy called Philippe Gelluc, who's a Belgian, who has a kind of cat cartoon character. And in this one, it's called uh, Payback Time. And for once, a car is crushed by a cat. So there you go. Any questions? Any points of order or questions for Bob? Wookie's got his hand up. I have one. Oh, yeah. What I've asked people to do in the chat. Or have you got a like? Yeah. I've gone in, Claire. I think Wookie was first. Oh, what? What? I think, uh, Wookie, were you going to come in on the reportage thing? Because I asked people. In yeah, the chat that was the idea. I could, I could just tell you what happened here if you but... care. I don't have any questions for Robert. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Claire, what do you want to say? Yeah, it looks like oh, uh, there's not well, many anyway. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah my, on, my, my question was, um, you just suddenly made me think, it's like cross hatchings. Have they had their day? Why do they still exist? Should they just be gone? Because actually there isn't enough room on the road. So that's, yeah, those who know better than me, why are they still there? Are they not a, an anachronism now? Can you define cross hatching, please? You know, the white bits in the middle of the road with the lines on them. So cent central, central hatch strip. Central hatching, yes. Yeah, I knew I wouldn't use the right terminology. Yeah. No, no, you're right. Get rid of them all. <laughs> yeah. Can anyone tell me why they're still here? And, and yes, have they I can tell you, so that motorists can relax more and not have to think about driving properly. For right yeah. turn islands, that sort of thing. Yeah, but it's like, it's normally when you... Do a right turn like pocket and then you want to carry it through there's lots of hatching there but like some people put them in in the uh, back in the day as traffic calming you now the, there's a hell of a lot of it out there and like it have a little bit of a visually narrow the lanes kind of thing it, it has been used for like uh well for positive purposes but I, I agree with kate it's usually pretty much always has a negative consequence so uh yeah get rid of it 
Like the IRAP people are still out the capacity in. reduction. Sorry, Kate, you said IRAP are still into it. I bet they yeah, are. Yeah, IRAP still advocate it for casualty reduction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's a lot I disagree with them on. Yeah. It feels like where I see them in, in Manchester, they're like, oh, we've got a massive wide road. We don't really know what to do with it. Oh, let's put some hatchings in, slow people down. Why don't you just put a bike lane in? Anyway, thanks for that, experts. Yeah. Yeah, get rid. Um, well, okay, I'll just ask you if there's any like a specific question for Bob's section, because then I'm going to move around and ask for people to report on, on the politics. Any any more? So just jump in, because uh, I know there's hands up, but I'm assuming you for the for the reporting section. Okay. Quick one, Bob. Chris, 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 Chris Paul. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm just on Claire's point. I mean, um, we've got we've got some terrible uh, bike lanes being reinstated on Bollamore Road, so really really narrow partly because of this central hatching. Uh, but it's really pleasing to see on Upper Chorlton Road, which is part of the Chorlton Cycleway, that all the pedestrian refuges have now been removed from it and, and fenced off. And I think that means that they're going to take away the, all the hatching and all the wasted space. And that's really positive. So we've got a kind of mixed thing, even within the same borough, on the same basic, on the same road, there's a mixed thing going on there with central reservations. Yeah, if you can take photos before and after of that, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I think part of the cross hatching is when you do have something that's an obstruction, um, because it's a it's a, a road marking that's not there for bollards and things for cyclists, and when curb build outs go, because the hatch is also used to drive people away with white lines. We don't have that for the, a lot of things that stick out mm -hmm. from the curb for cycling. Yeah, you can just have the line going towards the edge to take you away from the obstruction and not have the exit hatcher, which is kind of what we recommended. Yeah. Well, yeah. when I was at Transport for London, trying to get everybody to do that to avoid it. So there, there are ways around the obstruction argument as well. We'll say, um, shall we move into the exciting new section and do a little bit of a reportage around the around the country? I'll I'll go with people in the cad order they put their hands up or the order that is said to me because. Uh, um, there's a few people that said, I'll talk as well. Well, we'll go to Wookie first. Uh, what's that mean? What's that mean in your neck of the woods? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's been quite exciting. So Cambridge and Peterborough is uh, a combined authority. Peterborough is a unitary authority. And then there's Cambridge City Council. So it's all a bit complicated. But uh, basically, the, the city has remained solidly. It's got more, slightly more Labour. It's Labour and Lib Dem share solidly and rather radically they lost control so it kind of depends on the independence to actually set up a council i think but certainly that's we've got a labor mayor as well so uh which again has kicked out a conservative who had crazy plans about billions of pounds worth of tunnels under cambridge and a, a gadget barn uh, so now we're going to get lots of buses and spend proper money on buses, assuming you can find some money. So that's all pretty encouraging, really, as uh, the short version. We'll see what actually yeah. happens. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, that sounds really good. You were kind and, of and we've had some very controversial NTN like... stuff as well, and those councillors have stayed in, um, which is also good. Yeah, that seems to be the picture across the country, doesn't it? That's uh, pretty good on that one. All right, we'll, uh, we'll go to our healing correspondent. I might even give you a half and then break down later as well. And Martin, want to come in uh, and tell us what's been happening? Yes. Um, well, our Ealing um, council leader has um, lost his job. There was a vote um, yesterday by Ealing Labour members and uh, our very pro-cycling leader has been replaced by um, someone else. Um, so we hope that um, uh, the replacement, Peter Mason, will continue supporting the LTNs, but it's a slightly worrying time. Um, you do know who he works for, Martin? Commonplace, yes. Yes. So, yes. So yeah, so um, that not yeah. less worrying? or Well... It's his, it's his baby. Sorry, I have to interrupt. Commonplace is his thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, he's, he's been hugely attacked by the antis, of course, when they realised that a Labour councillor was also working for Commonplace, and they immediately thought that it couldn't be an unbiased um, assessment of the LTNs. Um, 
And then on the votes, uh, we had three by-elections and the Conservatives lost support in their wards that, that they held and Labour lost support in its ward that it held. So it's really hard to tell what's happening exactly. So we're waiting for the ward-by-ward -ward results of the, um, the mayoral election, which will give us a better clue of politically where everything stands. That's brilliant. Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that like a politician gets criticised for being an expert at engaging with people. <laughs> but uh, there you go, there's a uh, one to think about, isn't there? Um, uh, Chris, Chris Paul, is your hand, is that a historical hand? No, that, that's a, an our hand. Now. I think Claire will probably have some views about all this as well. In, in the city of Manchester itself, the Labour group got back to uh, 95, 94 out of 96, and uh, so there's a couple of vacancies plus a, a gain from the Gre from the Lib Dems, uh, but one seat was lost to the Greens. Um, that was in Woodhouse Park, which is the ward that has the airport, and we'll get the new HS2 mainline station. Um, but those are not things that the Green candidate mentioned on his um, his literature, which was all about just attacking Labour. And he, among the people that have been uh, in the previous time, 2019, he was endorsed by Tommy Robinson and by the various uh, you know, sort of gang people in, in Windsor. So I'm not sure it's, it's a great great news story that we've got a green councillor, uh, as it might have been if it had been in, in different circumstances. The rest of GM, we lost Sean Fielding, who was the leader of, of Oldham, who was a very good advocate for this, this agenda. Um, mm. And Stockport, as Cathy has mentioned, is a sort of still hung. It always is no overall control Stockport, pretty much. But the Labour group are no longer the largest party. The Lib Dems are the largest party by one seat because Labour lost a seat to uh, the Greens. Again, it's a Green uh, gain and the first one uh, Green for a while in Stockport. So Claire may have other things to add, but I think it's generally good. Andy Burnham just smashed it, uh, 67%, and that's without even having any transfers. He didn't need the transfers. He was probably 80% and he'd had to have the transfers as well. Um, so that's massive um, confirmation for Chris Boardman and Brian and all the work that's been going on uh, in, our, in our interest areas. Uh, good man. Yeah, they're, they are a bit of a mixed bag, the Greens. I do hope the... Uh get it together. I mean, um, Clyde Lokes often talks that the Greens were fighting him on the Millie Holland stuff there as well. So yeah, get, get on top of it, Green Party. Um, well, really if, Car if Caroline isn't here, Caroline Russell isn't here, I can answer on, as part of the Green Party's Transport Working Group, if you want, on, um, because I think that's a bit unfair, Brian. Um, it, one of the things about it, the Green Party... It was Party, a bit unfair. I mean, I, I could have a go at other parties, but, but could this is... Can I just is... off on the GM stuff? Yes, of course, go ahead. Go on, Mark, I'll, I'll come to you after no, Ruth, because no, you're going to do let a Claire, Let Claire finish first. If it, yeah, if I just... So Chris has sort of summed up the boroughs, but in terms of um, Andy Burnham, so so what was really interesting was he, he kind of did his um, first announcement day on Monday, and he's come out very strongly, as he was in his manifesto, but often, you know, manifesto doesn't translate into real world. But he's come out on Monday and gone, you know, transport is the big, uh, the big priority for me in the next term, which is only three years because of the COVID thing. Um, and kind of committing to uh, wanting to create an integrated transport network for the whole of GM by 2024. Um, Obviously, that won't be finished by 2024, but the big thing would be moving buses into that, which he started before the election. Um, so he's also making a play to bring rail inside the Greater Manchester Control, commuter rail. Um, and I think he's, he's made it clear he's going to start his sort of tactics on that is to basically say network rail two thirds of your stations are inaccessible in Greater Manchester, unless you make them accessible within this time frame. then give me the stations, which basically means giving him the trains. So he wants to think, you know, GM buses, GM rail. And then the other interesting thing, which has had mixed reaction from some of the cycling campaigners is that um, the B network is the thing that they, we've, we've called, you know, the, the Boardman plan for, um, 
walking and cycling in Greater Manchester and it's in, in process. Um, he, Boardman's big thing is to rebrand this or brand this integrated network as the B network. So not just the walking and cycling bit, but to, to make the whole the network be like yellow and black livery and call it the B network. And so that's quite interesting, you know, mixed views. Some people are like, well, what do we call the walking and cycling bit? And is it diluting that? And other people are like, I'm more in this camp, which is, well, the alternative would be you have two, you have like a transport network and a walking and cycling network. And that's not what we want either. Um, and then lastly, um, he did follow through and say he's going to pilot tram uh, bikes and dogs on trams off peak, which um, is one of our big campaign goals. Although you know campaigners in Greater Manchester have been campaigning for that for years, so so we look forward to holding him to account on that. Oh, well, I'll, I'll give Mark a right to reply. I'll, I'll let him come in on his report, thing, but just to say from my side. Yeah, I said it would love Mark. You know, I love Caroline. No, I know, uh, but but uh, I just think, yeah, I think it's important. But like, by all means, tell me off. Well, well, first of all, the, the Caroline Russell, who we know, or those of us not from London might not know, but is um, been very active on the GLA. She's the Green Party's local transport spokesperson, and I think everyone who knows what Caroline's been doing would 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 agree that she's been really positively supportive of everything we've been doing. One of the distinctive things about the Green Party is that local parties are tend, uh, effectively autonomous um, and we can't really stop them doing things. Um, we don't have whips and we don't have um, that degree of central control that other parties have. So if local parties um, try to be stupid, they tend to be able to get away with it. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's the position the Green Party as a whole to do either of the things we're talking about. And you can only need to look at it at Southampton, where the the loss was the was the Green Party was because of the airport and people were campaigning against the airport. So now the, the different things in different places. So I'll talk about Brighton and, and Sussex later. But I think I think you know those examples are very much exceptions, and we could all point to you know other places which are similarly exceptions and and um, and I'm not going to have a go at Labour about certain Labour Party people who are not very negative either. And, and Tories who are positive, you know, people book the trend. Yeah, that's the right tone, Mark. It's the tone that I should have adopted before starting to get us all going on politics. But hey, there you go. Um, Ruth, what's happening in your neck of the woods? Um, I think the pity is regardless of whether once proportional representation we don't have it at the moment first past the post and southwest london went but tory again but he had a very small very reduced majority which if one other party had stood down the liberal democrats would have got in um so that's a shame and the same with west central i don't know if anyone is here from kensington unfortunately we've got tony devonish back again it's not his politics that I dislike, it's his attitude to cycling. And his majority was reduced from something like 16,000 to one and a half thousand. So if people had only voted strategically on this occasion, we'd have lost Devonish and we'd have replaced Tony Arbour with someone who actually cares about cycling. And I think that's a pity. All right. Cheers, Ruth. There we go. Oh, let me have a look at the list. Probably should line up. Oh, I was too busy listening. Um, David, Yeah, there's been some interesting political results in Sheffield. So the Greens have had big gains. And in, in fairness to Mark, the Greens here are very much pro cycling and uh, walking, um, although they did scalp the very, very high, um, very supportive of cycling Labour leader. So the Labour group may well change direction. But what I thought was worth talking about the Sheffield results is we've also had a governance referendum. So and we've had a big campaign in Sheffield about switching to committee systems. And Sheffield is a very, very lefty city. Um, we've got our first Tory councillor in, I think it's 20 years um, in these elections. So this it's a very different environment. But if you live in a lefty area, it's distinctly possible you might get campaigns at the back of how Sheffield Council does um, switching towards committee system. And that means that more of your local councillors have a say compared to the kind of strong leader and um, cabinet model. Um, particularly as we've now moved to no overall control so yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens in chef yeah interesting stuff all happening out there tim let's stay in yorkshire what's happening in york 
Thanks, Brian. Um, no elections in York this year. We had them a few couple of years ago. It's the Liberal Green Alliance, and the chair of the Transport Executive, to follow Dave's point, is Green. And I attended a meeting this morning, um, first one actually, where they back back face to face. Um, and one interesting thing, the, the, uh, the chair, um, Councillor Andy de Gorn, had read a, a long report about improving some traffic signals at um, the Gilly Gate. A booth and bar junction, one of the historic bars coming to York, and said that uh, the two options the officers have presented both scored zero on the junction assessment tool, and because of lots of other comments about they haven't really, you know, they, they, it's not good enough for active travel. He's deferred the decision to replace the traffic signals with brand new signals uh, till next cycle. So that was very um, following mainly the Civic Trust doing a, a good sort of very good paper from Professor Tony May who was at Leeds of a university professor. Uh, so that's encouraging. So we, so the moment we've got a uh, good politician sort of steering the, the bike through the, the transport policies, but uh, trying to push the officers to, to follow uh, LTN 120, which they sort of are starting to, but finding it very hard, I think, with our narrow streets and their sort of, um, sort of way of doing things really. Uh, so. That's that's New York. Um, elections may change. Uh, we had a we had a Lib Conservative pact before, uh, and they were taking out cycle facilities, which was terrible. So at least we're getting them back in, and they, the councils are questioning the officers. Yeah, good to hear that they're using the junction assessment tool. I kind of know they're using it right if they're getting zero percent on it. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> to, to design two options and, and put in a report that they both scored nothing, so you know. Which is the best one for cycling? It's really not. Fair play for publishing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Thank you. Good. All right. Um, Dave, our man in Glasgow. Go on, Dave. What's happening? And what will it sound like? Oh, it's gone. Can't believe I offered Dave. Uh, Holiday, the chance to speak, and he's not taken it. All right, I'm sorry, Brian. I didn't realize somebody had muted well, me. Well. Um, yeah, we we had Energy Saving Trust Scotland offering people two grand if they scrapped an old car, and a further two individual payments of up to five hundred pounds to buy bikes, bus passes exclusively. Unfortunately, the two grand was could be used to buy a new car, whereas I was hoping we might do something similar to West Midlands offer where you get up to three grand to buy, you can only buy bus passes, car clubs, bike hire, or a new electric bike. Take up's been poor at the moment. It's been under publicized and very few people have taken the 500 quid to get bikes, which is a, a real pity because we, we could really make progress there. Um, we've got an electric coach that uh, has got a different booking software. So you can reserve bikes and wheelchairs in real time and the driver actually sees this in real time on the manifest. So they know they're going to be picking a wheelchair or a cyclist up. And it doesn't run into towns or cities. It uh, runs from Edinburgh to Dundee, uh, up the M90 and the A90, and pulls off to, um, you know, a roundabout in, in, in Resyth, Kinross Interchange, which is literally just off the M90, and around about halfway between Perth and Dundee. Those sort of places are generally easy to cycle to or get to you know, with a, a local bus. So it's got a very fast service and it's an all electric coach service. So we're, we're going all electric up here. Um, right. and, Did you yeah, have any comments on, on like, what? On politics? <laughs> oh, well, we're doing a kind of like summary of like the uh, political climate, well, but. It's good to know about buses as well. And at least you didn't mention the second referendum, which uh, I had a pound on. Well, I think we, we know what we're going to do in that respect. Um, and uh, we, we will have a lot of pushback against what London's doing. Uh, London can try and send money to Scotland, but, but don't forget that across the border, Transport Scotland does everything. And uh, I'd like to do a comparison of what they're trying to do in Manchester and Leeds. Um, the, the distance by rail between uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow is 47 miles. Between Manchester and Leeds, it's 48. Um, we've electrified all the routes between 
Edinburgh and Glasgow over the past 10 years, and um, Manchester is struggling. So you know, we, we've got this integrated possibility. And the other thing that was, uh, Andy, Andy Burnham did a video about how long it takes to get on the bus between Middleton and um, Media City, little realizing that he should have done it by bike, which would have taken a third of the time. So I think that's he the knew. He knew, we told him. <laughs> Really? You know. It didn't come it, out. You know. And, yeah. um, it's been good to see a lot of people coming on bikes when they do do the presentations. Um, so, and they do get it. Uh, we definitely get it because uh, a lot of money's going into uh, bike share and schemes that are going in and electric cars. So we're going into the mobility as a service product, which I think is going to be the way to win a lot of people out of cars. Uh, and an interesting one in terms of accessibility, when you see how many people, how many people were going to the Louisa Jordan Hospital, which unlike the Nightingales is still functioning um, because it's being used as a mass vaccination centre and you can cycle there, you can walk there and it's, it's got cycle parking. All right, Dave, D Dave, at that point, I'll ju just because just we're trying out a new session, I'll just go around the other areas to see yeah. what's happening politically and get myself back into some kind of like a seminars. But yeah, cheers for that. Always interesting, mate. Um, Mark? Mark, old man. Yes, thanks. I've got three councils, three areas to, to sum up, and I, unless Clive's here from West Sussex and Shoreham. So in Brighton, Hove, we just had two by-elections. Um, and interestingly, um, what I was saying before, Labour's been equivocal in Brighton. Um, and the one marginal that went was between Green and Labour, Greens won. And um, Greens also did very well against the Tories, who have been less than equivocal and really anti. Um, but the, it was a Tory safe seat, but it isn't safe anymore. So that's the update. And you'll see in my background um, the, the 1057 logo being applied on the seafront and the cycle track is now being green. But in East and West Sussex, it's really Labour that's done really well. And some Greens, particularly in Worthing, which is a district council where the majority is only one and the leader of Worthing Council, who was actually a Tory that's very keen on cycling, but he's been complaining uh, that, that his majority has been cut to one. And this is all local Tories seeing money going to the north, going to the uh, Red Wall, former Red Wall places in the north, and the local areas that have always been Tory are not being rewarded and not seeing the money. And therefore they decided the Tories aren't working for them, so they're switching to Labour. So it's the complete opposite of what people have been saying in, in places like Hartlepool. And what's interesting is those Labour councillors in Worthing are very keen on cycling and indeed in Shoreham as well. So I think that in the areas, and, and Roger may be interested to hear that we're hearing distinct rumbles that the cabinet member in, in West Sussex, who was the one who made the decision to pull out the old Shoreham Road, is unlikely, although you never know, but unlikely to be returned as the, it's still Tory controlled, but unlikely to be returned as the cabinet member for transport for West Sussex. Um, and partly, you know, that is a judgment on his a judgment on his judgment about pulling the roots out. Now, that may or may not make the council change its mind on um, the judicial review, but it gives them if it is a different cabinet member, at least gives them a bit of political um, coverage to change their mind and say, oh, well, it was his fault and we've now changed our mind or they may not. But um, it might be useful for Roger to, to follow that one up. Thanks for that, Mark. Yeah, re really good. And, and yeah, always interesting to get these stories of uh, politicians that do badly after fighting against, you know, saving the planet agenda. Always nice. Um, Emma, Emma Young, do you want to come in? Oh, uh, yeah, just to say that we've got our first uh, mayor for West Yorkshire and they're female, so big tick in the box for the uh, diversity bit. Um, Unclear what she's going to do. Man Manifesto wasn't really publicised, but uh, I went to a webinar Living Streets held and she said that she was going to get a cycling, walking and cycling commissioner with the support of the district councils, um, something about 20 mile per hour zones she was supportive of and Vision Zero. So I'll have to see. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Uh, yeah, I was making notes on that one because I wondered which way to go. Yeah, and I saw she was on the bus saying how terrible it took to, how long it took to use public transport and stuff. So that was good that she's getting Yeah, that's one of her top training. priorities as well is uh, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, Robin, welcome in. 
Yeah, thanks, Brian. So we're Oxfordshire. Um, so we've really seen some uh, big gains for uh, politicians who supported uh, active travel. Um, we used to have a majority, a working majority for the Conservatives. Um, they were just slightly under a numerical majority, but they they could rope in a few Conservative leading independents to get what they were doing, doing uh, get what they wanted done. And um, they were starting to do a few things on active travel, but quite slowly. But uh, we, we really campaigned hard on this election. Uh, I think it's fair to say it wasn't just the active travel, but um, we had one of our, um, actually one of our biggest LTN fans who was organize, helping to organize and, and promote a progressive alliance. Uh, so some of the Lib Dems and Labour people and Greens were standing down and encouraging tactical voting. Uh, plus quite a lot of issues around planning and where houses were going before infrastructure. And I think all that helped. The end result were very big gains for Lib Dems, very a uh, couple of gains for Labour and uh, for the Greens went from zero seats to three seats. And so the Lib Dems, once a, a slight technical error on one seat is sorted, Lib Dems will be equal with the Conservatives. Um, they, my guess is they'll form a uh, an alliance of some kind with Labour, both of whom are very strong on um, active travel. It was in a lot of their election literature. We know the the candidates and councillors very well, and uh, we are really looking forward to uh, working with them to move things on a pace over the next four years. Very excited. Mm, yeah, brilliant. I'll help me in that. Um, Matthew, go over to, to Durham. Yeah, um, well, the one of the largest unitary authorities, Durham County Council, has fallen to uh, no overall control after a long period of Labour control. Um, what it'll mean uh, for transport, it's very hard to say, but the um, previous uh, administration had uh, twice attempted to produce a uh, local plan, uh, including major relief roads. Uh, which were twice uh, kicked out by planning inspectors and the second time round, which was 2019, um, they conceded and uh, so um, we're now in a situation where the new um, administration will be having to formulate transport policies without the major relief roads that have been planned in the past. Um, whether this is going to be good or not is very hard to tell because they're now dusting off plans for uh, widening or increasing the number of lanes on more urban roads in order to accommodate what they still see as the need to increase um, traffic flow. Um, however, we have got our first uh, green uh, county councillor, um, which uh, will be interesting. Um, Aside from that, the Lib Dems gained a little bit and the Conservatives gained uh, rather more. We ran a survey uh, of uh, attitudes to cycling for, among uh, candidates from about half of the electoral divisions um, and got a certain amount of positive response, but very hard to say. Uh, worryingly, the Conservatives uh, didn't really cooperate in that survey at all. Um, and uh, the Lib Dems didn't really respond individually, but gave a fairly positive um, overall policy statement. Um, so we have to push on that and see what we can manage. Yeah, it looks like you got your work cut out there. Good luck with that one. Um, Graham, what's happening in Bolton? Yeah, um, yeah, sorry to bring everybody back to Greater Manchester, but I, I just felt that perhaps um, other parts of Greater Manchester, you've heard from people who live in Manchester. Um, it, we're very pleased with the things that, uh, that, that the, uh, the Greater Manchester Mayor has been saying, I mean, Andy Burnham saying all the right things. He said all the right things before the elections as well. Um, one of the problems we have with that in Bolton, of course, is that there's a lot of people here who haven't forgotten 1974 and still resent the fact that we're no longer in Lancashire and are in Greater Manchester. Uh, so that, that can be an issue. Um, the changes that have occurred, we, Bolton was for a long time uh, the Holy Labour Control Council, and then at the last elections that changed, uh, and it went to roughly one third, one third, one third, 
uh, Conservative, Labour and independents and small parties. Um, the balance was with the Labour Party, but the Conservatives were in power because of uh, um, agreements with the smaller parties. Uh, that has shifted a little bit more in favour of the Conservatives now, who now have one, they have 20, 20 councillors, Labour have 19, um, the Lib Dems only have five, uh, and the rest are, the, we have quite a lot of independents and uh, small, part, small hyper-local parties uh, around particular towns like Horwich, uh, Farnworth and so on. Um, and we're actually waiting now for, to, to see what, uh, what, the, government, what the, the council looks like, because there's not actually been a council formed yet. Um, and because it's so sort of equally divided, it's not necessarily clear. It probably will be still a conservative controlled council, but with the support of other small parties. That means that there's often a reluctance for the Conservatives, who are the biggest part of that alliance, to do really radical things because they don't want to upset their support because they could easily lose the, uh, the control. Um, one of the things that I found frustrating was that the, the constituency, the, the, the ward with the biggest turnout was actually Heaton and Lostock ward, which is the ward where the council who's been fighting against the trolling new roads or leading the fight against the trolling new road um, active um, travel fund scheme uh, was and he was returned with a huge majority which is a bit unfortunate it would be nice to, uh, to have seen his majority at least reduced um, as a result of that of the of the campaigning um, so that's basically where we sit it's a bit strange here in that um, the the officers the, the off local authority actually do get it. They really want to make the changes that we're pushing for, but it's actually the council and the cabinet that are, that are tending to block things. Um, and uh, perhaps they're doing it because that's what their constituents are telling them, but, uh, but that's, the, that's the situation at the moment. Uh, cheers for that, Graham. That was a really good summary. Yeah, I can't say too much because I'm too involved in all that. Um, so I'll move on to Ian from Nottingham. Oh, uh, yeah. So we've got two two authorities going on here. We've got Nottingham City, you know, two authorities surrounded by county council and district councils and all that business. Um, City didn't actually have any elections this time, but well, you can have a quick update on them. They're, they seem to be, from where I'm sitting, excellent at writing bids, poor at delivering on the bids. Um, so on the active travel fund, they're one of the one of the um, authorities that managed to get more than their allocation. Um, but then we got things like low traffic neighbourhoods, which didn't cut out through routes. We got things like advisory cycle lanes painted as part of the EATF, which is not what you want to see, and and new parking provided for businesses as part of that as well. So yeah, all kind of a bit bit depressing. And we've recently been fighting in this cycle like, campaign a scheme to use pedestrians as, as traffic calming. You know, they you help know, put cyclists with the pedestrians because the pedestrians will slow those unruly cyclists down, and that's what we want to see. So it's all a bit depressing there. But um, surrounded by the county council, which did have elections, yeah, and that that changed from conservative minority to um, conservative majority. Uh, you might have seen in the news this is the council where the MP Ben Bradley from Mansfield stood to the county council won and is now going to be the county council's leader so he's going to be the mp and the leader at the same time which is very interesting uh questions as to whether he's going to have enough time to do either of those jobs well but he seems to think that he can um he's kind of a bit of a yeah like a blank canvas when it comes to cycling i've just been googling and he's never as far as i can tell said anything about cycling in the past but the previous person, there's a notorious comment where she basically said that cycling isn't a serious means of getting about. So the leader that's outgoing is, well, it's hard to get much worse than that, really. Um, um, recent example is ATF. They're one of the they were one of the authorities that got dinged on that. I think they got 40% of their indicative allocation because they were proposing essentially drop curbs. And then we got a note saying even that plan had been canned. And well, I did tip the DFT off to say they might want to try and get their money back. So we'll see if that happens. Um, so yeah, all a bit unknown in knots really, but we shall see if Ben Bradley has any, any interest in cycling. He's got a few borough councils underneath him who are very interested in, in road links. So we've got the Trent obviously, and um, 
Well, a lot of the councils want more road crossings over the Trent to connect the south side and the north side. They're pushing for that. So I suppose if he decides to put his weight behind that, that'll be interesting. So up till now, there's not been much support for those. Um, obviously coming with no cycling provision attached. So that's that. Oh, hi, mate. Yeah, no, it's uh, plenty to think about. I've always had Nottingham down as the kind of sleeping giant in uh, cycling city terms. One of these days, it'll wake up and go back to its... Walk the uh, talk, but walk in the walk, well, I don't think they found their legs yet, really. Yeah, yeah, similar. I'll, I'll move over to Jonathan now, because I'll come back to Mark and Bob to kind of round up this section there. Jonathan? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, just a quick quick update from Bristol and the, the, the west of England. So we had three levels of, of elections. We had local Bristol mayor, um, city mayor and west of England mayor. So the west of England was conservative um, and that went Labour um, and Dan Norris, the, the Labour um, uh, new new mayor um he did respond to the bristol cycling campaign and bristol walking alliance um requests about a walking and uh, walking and cycling commissioner and he said he would commit to that um and he'd follow national government's lead if they if they introduced both um he'd do it separately if they did it combined he'd do it combined so he's open to whether that's one role or or two um at the bristol city level um we had a labor mayor and he held held um although there was a strong green vote in second place and at the council level um there was a big surge towards the greens so we now have more green councillors than brighton so 20 in brighton 24 in um 24 in bristol um so it's gone from labor to no over all control with 24 you're bigger uh, than us. <laughs> You've got more per head. OK, so, so um, at the local level, the Greens got the biggest vote. Um, same number of councillors now as Labour. Um, and um, so both on 24, um, Conservatives on 11, I think, and Lib Dems on eight, the same as before. Interestingly, two um, Labour councillors who were cabinet members that lost their um, places were um, the one for transport and the one for climate um, and the, the one for transport, both the Walking Alliance and the Bristol Cycling Campaign actually had quite a reasonable relationship with him um, and he was reasonably positive. Um, and I wonder whether it's more more a, a vo vote on, uh, because they both went green, I wonder if it's more a vote on what the council has been doing overall in terms of the speed for um, with regard to air pollution climate and walking and cycling rather than um, uh, uh, an indictment on those in, in individuals but so sort of mixed bag but um, reasonably positive for walking and cycling I think. Thanks for that Jonathan yeah I've been sticking my nose in Bristol business the last week or so as well and it's very positive the stuff that I'm hearing. Um, all right let's go to Bob first, and then I'll come to Mark for the roundup of this section. And then we'll be back with Jonathan to uh, hit some research. Bob, yeah. want to come in? Um, OK, so uh, I was going to say something about London. Uh, I was really hoping that Simon Monk could uh, do a roundup, but he's not here today. And maybe it's not appropriate for him as the big charity that has to work with uh, TfL and the GLA to say things, so I think I will. Um, there's an extra green London Assembly member. On the whole, some people were saying this is a kind of referendum on LTNs because more LTNs have gone in in London than anywhere else. It's easier to put stuff in in, the, uh, in London than anywhere else. There have been some pop-up cycle lanes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but uh, a, a, name, a, a mayor who's going ahead with Silvertown Tunnel, who uh, you know can do what he can with the money he can. We don't know what that's going to be like. Uh, it's uh, we don't know. It depends if he and Will Norman and others get tough with the boroughs that haven't done things the right way. It depends on what money he gets from the government. It depends if he's prepared to grasp the road charging, smart charging agenda. Um, 
it depends on all these things. So we don't know. And of course, councils haven't changed their complexion. There may be some odd bits and pieces like Martin was talking about uh, the loss of the leader who'd been very pro cycling and healing. Um, so we don't know. Bottom line, still money from the government and we need to get active travel funding stuff done properly everywhere. We need to get Traffic Management Act 2004 section uh, part six changed. We need to get more of a push from people like Gilligan. We need to get Active Travel England sorted out. These are the things that should really be making uh, a difference. Uh, also, since it's just gone up in the chat, I should point out that there is a uh, long line of honourable speakers at the Islington Cycling Action Group, uh, AGM. The keynote speakers have, have been uh, Boris Johnson, Christian Walmar, uh, Isabel Clément, uh, Jeremy Vine and myself. And uh, the, that list will be added to by Will Norman, who's the mayor's um, cycling commissioner, cycling and walking commissioner. So you may want to go to that meeting, which is a, you know, a webinar, a virtual meeting, and find out more about what's happening in London or what might happen. That's it. Thanks, Bob. Let's move over to, to Mark then. So Mark's going to tell us what he's going to tell us and do a little wrap up this section as well, because uh, then it will. Did you have your hand up or is that a historical hand, Mark? Oh, me? No, it was a historical hand. Sorry. I thought uh, I'd take it. Uh, Sorry, I'll do it. But what I, I wanted to ask, can I put a marker down for Don for next week? Because he said he can't stay from Liverpool. But it'd be really interesting to hear about the, the multiple changes of both the council and the two yeah. mayors in Liverpool and how that, and Merseyside, sorry, in Liverpool. Um, how yeah, that I've been begging Don to come on for ages. So, uh, well, I'll be there at the weekend, but yeah, I'm not going to be doing any politics. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll wrap this bit up then, but that's been a really interesting discussion and uh, I'm hoping we can pick it up again once we've digested it all, think about uh, what should we do. I know we had the conversations with Roger Gaffin and uh, Roxanne, like I was talking about it as well. So, uh, what do we do with these new councillors? How do we shape them to our wills? <laughs> There's a, there's a topic for another time, but I'll um, I'll introduce uh, Jonathan now. He's uh, one of my favourite researchers, he's doing lots of interesting stuff, and I'm hoping he's going to ask us all to help with some of the stuff he's doing. So, Jonathan, yeah, the, the floor is yours. Tell us what's happening in the world of academia. Thank you. We're back in the West Country. Okay. <laughs> uh, see if I can share my screen. Um... Oh yeah, we've got the um the weird view of it. Have you? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll run here. Is that better? Um yeah. I'm, oh there we go, that's better. Perfect. Okay. Good. You are good to go. Thanks, Brilliant. Man. Okay, so for those that don't know me, um I'm a transport planner. Um in the recent part of my life, I'm on the board of the Transport Planning Society. Um, and I'm a research fellow at the um, Centre of Transport and Society at uh, the University of West of England. And uh, the thing I'd like to talk about for a few minutes is I've been working on a couple of projects um, and some of you on this um, uh, webinar have been involved either as part of our advisory panels or as um, key informants to those studies. Um, so the first one, uh, but both of them about creating priority for walking, cycling and rolling at um, side road junctions. Um, here in the West Country, we don't do beer very well, um, tends to be cider. Um, and this is my local brew from my, my street, North, North Street. Um, Brian's promise next time we meet to uh, get me a pint. Um, you're probably, many of you are familiar with this. Um, this comes from the um, LTM 1, 120. Um, basically the first study was um, evaluating the effectiveness of continuous side road crossings 
um, which provide priority for people walking, cycling um, and rolling by design as per those three bottom um, design priority images, so T6, T7 um, and T8. Um, and that work was commissioned by Sustrans and Transport Scotland with a view to inform Transport Scotland's revision of uh, its cycling by design design guidance. Um, and those three versions of the continuous um, crossings that you can see are described um, as full setback, partial setback and um, no setback. And of course, that's from the cyclist per, um, perspective rather than the pedestrian. From a pedestrian perspective, you could um, equally label them left or right, no setback, full setback, um, partial setback. So must remember there's a difference in perspective between pedestrians and cyclists. So this is um, what we did. Um, we if we're evaluating the effectiveness of um, continuous side road crossings. Um, we did some observational studies. We videoed um, uh, 10 junctions, six in London, one in Leeds, one in Nottingham, one in Southampton, and one in Edinburgh. And they were all continuous footways um, with cycle tracks, or in two cases, cycle lanes across the junction. Um, we also looked at the co collision data, um, conducted some focus groups, and um, some key informant interviews. Um, just here are three examples of uh, junctions that were included. Um, this one um, on the A3, the Oval in, in London, uh, and this one is out only and turn left only if you're a, um, a motor vehicle. Um, this one from Leeds um, on Kirkstall Road. Um, this one um, allowed um, movements in all directions in and out. And this one was in Edinburgh um, on Leith Walk, and this is in only. Um, you can turn in left, turn in right. So what did we learn? Well, um, we learned that designs need to create a situation um, where the incidence of drivers of turning vehicles not giving way is negligibly small. Um, and at the same time, in the rare occurrence that the driver doesn't give way, the design needs to ensure that the vehicle speed is so low that they don't collide with crossing pedestrians or cyclists. Um, and this is some of the, a list of some of the design features that will help achieve that. And um, we also learned the continuous footway design features should slow the progress of turning vehicles and at the same time make the look and feel of a crossing that provides priority by design to people that walk, cycle or roll. And in terms of um, the flows, both, both the flows of pedestrians and cyclists crossing the side road and also the um, vehicles turning in and in and out the side road, we found um, some interesting things. So for the continuous crossway crossing to be appropriate and function well um, with few or no pedestrian or cycle yields to turning vehicles, it was important that the crossing movements needed to be greater than the turning movements. So the, the number of pedestrians and cyclists crossing had to be greater than the number of vehicles turning in and out that side road plus one of um, any of these three things. Um, some of the situations we saw were very low flows of turning tra traffic and low um, numbers of pedestrians and cycle crossing. And there were few interactions, few times when the, um, someone crossing um, did that at the same time as someone turning in and out of that junction. So when you had low turning and low crossing flows and few interactions inter occurring, the junction functioned well for all users. Um, the second option was crossing movements, um, crossing in terms of pedestrians and cyclists across the junction controlled the turning movements. So in these cases, there were very high numbers of pedestrians and cyclists um, crossing the mouth of the junction. Um, and when turning vehicles um, turned in or out of those junctions, they had to yield um, for more than one person crossing at a time. That worked well. And then thirdly, um, we had the situation where the turning movements and interactions uh, balanced. So you, you had very high 
numbers of people crossing, um, pedestrians and cyclists, and you had very high uh, vehicle numbers of vehicles turning in and out of the junction. Um, and in these scenarios, the high crossing turns and uh, high crossing and turning flows of turning vehicles often led to a yield um, for, uh, for a pedestrian or cyclist, uh, so, sorry, a yield for a turning vehicle for more than one person crossing. Uh, but also we had some times of the day when some people crossing encountered more than one turning, turning vehicle. And that worked reason, reasonably well. Um, so the first scenario, the low numbers of turns and people crossing worked fine in the example I showed in Leeds and also in another one in Nottingham. Um, the high, high crossing numbers um, and low turning numbers worked fine in the Oval and Kensington. Um, and then both turns and crossing numbers being high and somewhat balanced, um, that worked okay in um, one of the junctions in Walthamstow. And on the negative, um, negative side, um, with turns much higher than crossing numbers, it doesn't work. Um, so it, the continuous crossings are not appropriate and will not function well when the crossing uh, cause, when the, it's causing many false pedestrian and cycle yields if the turning movements are controlling the crossing movements. So if you have far more people turning into the junction uh, and out of the junction, then you have movements crossing the junction. What tends to happen is every time someone's crossing, uh, every time there's an interaction, people crossing um, will uh, meet more than one vehicle. Um, and that's the, that's kind of scenario functions badly. And we saw that at our example in um, Southampton. Um, interestingly, the, there are things that you could do to mitigate against that um, in the Southampton case. You could reduce the demands for the number of turns um, by an intervention such a point, uh, as a point closure um, in, in the side road. You could ban some turning movements and actually Southampton um, City Council have banned one of the movements on this junction um, since we did the study last year. Um, they, they banned the most problematic turn in right movement, which was the one causing the most problems at this particular junction. Or you could uh, try and do something to induce crossing movements by pedestrians and cyclists. So as well as Transport Scotland, um, Bristol City Council have already used the study um, to inform their design guidance here in Bristol, um, which they plan to use to install continuous footways um, on certain walking and cycling routes across the city. So that's something in progress and they've already written their guidance. So for my second part, I wanted to um, ask uh, for your help. So my current study is evaluating the effectiveness of signs and road markings to provide priority for um, people walking, cycling and rolling by marked priority as per the images um, at the top there, T1 um, to T5. So these are all marked priority. You've got full setback, partial setback and no setback again. T1 and T2 um, are parallel crossings. Um, and T3 to T5 um, are not, not parallel crossing. Parallel crossings being a, a parallel cycle track alongside a, a, a zebra crossing. Um, so in this study, we're looking at um, 15 examples of um, T1 to T, T5. And we're looking to do that between the 17th of May and the end of the month. Um, and it would be good if any of you have um, local intelligence um, or access to people, know people in these uh, uh, areas that could provide that intelligence and it would be good if you could put them in contact with me. So what I'm looking for is a, a current photo of each of these junctions, um, some knowledge about whether the traffic levels, including crossing pedestrians and cyclists, are anywhere close to pre-COVID levels, um, and is anything happening in the vicinity of any of these junctions that would interfere with the normal function of the junction. Um, such as roadworks. So I'm just going to whiz through the, the, the 15 junctions um, and um, please contact me. Uh, I'll give my contact details at the end if um, you're able to help on any of these. So the first two are in Birmingham um, and this one is on the A34 um, Milton Road um, and it's um, like type one. It's a parallel crossing um, set back from the, the, the main road and the little Roman numerals there indicate is a, a bi-directional cycle track. 
Second one also in Birmingham. This is a T2, again, a parallel crossing, this time with um, partial setback um, and the little S denoting that either side it's shared space rather than a cycle track. And for both of those, um, they allow movements in all directions. The next two are in Bradford, Leeds. This one's Bradford Valley, Valley Road. Um, again, a um, T1, so a, um, a parallel crossing, um, a bi-directional cycle track and fully set back. And this one leads on the A64 Wakebeck Road. This is T3 now, it's not a parallel crossing. Um, so a fully set back with a unidirectional cycle track. This one's Cheltenham, um, Hester's Way. Um, Hester's Way Road, this is a, a T3, um, so full setback and bi-directional cycle track. Bedford, Bedford Road, again a T3, um, quite a strange configuration here, but a, a T3 fully set back. It might not look like that in the picture, but it is, um, and a bi-directional cycle track. Um, we've also got a few controls in here. So this one um, in York, um, Halfill Road is um, comparing with a, um, a T3, but this isn't given priority for pedestrians and cyclists, cyclists across the um, across the road. It, it is has got a ra raised hump there, um, uh, so side entry side entry treatment, uh, but no um, marked priority for crossing pedestrians and cyclists. Another control here. This is Liverpool uh, Park Lane. This is comparing with the T4 examples. This is a partial setback, um, but no priority for crossing pedestrians and cyclists. Um, this one is, and, and the remainder ones are in the London area. So this is Kingston, um, just along the road from one we did in our last study on continuous footways. Um, this is a, a T3, so um, full setback uh, with a bi-directional cycle track on Denmark Road. Two in Ickenham, um, both, um, both adjacent to each other. Um, and uh, this one, I think, was one of the pictures used in the, um, uh, used alongside in the LTN 120. Um, so this is a T4 partial setback, bi-directional cycle track. And the adjacent ju junction, again, um, high road, High Road and Austin Lane, again a T4, bi-directional cycle track on one side and the shared shared use on the other side. Coming towards the end, London being place, um, St Pancras, uh, this is a T5, so no setback and a unidirectional cycle track. Enfield, um, Sebastopol Road, again, um, no setback, uh, unidirectional cycle track. This one, the Hyde Park on West Carriage uh, Drive. This is a, a T5, no setback, bi-directional um, cycle track, but, and only turn in, no turn outs on this one. And this is, I think, the final one. This is um, Brentford, um, Boston Manor. This is a control for type five with a bi-directional cycle track, side road entry treatment, but um, no priority for crossing pedestrians and, and cyclists. Thank you. So that, that was really all I all I had to share, but um, it would be good to know if, if any of you have intel on any of those things, I'd love to know. I think we had a couple of snaps there as we were going through, so uh, hopefully there will be people that can help you, Jonathan. Okay. And, uh, uh, yeah, we got a few questions lined up as well, so uh, I'll sure. jump straight into those. Um, yeah, Robert, Robert from Newcastle, want to ask a question to Jonathan? I, that, that was really interesting. One of, one of the things I'm really interested in is, since I'm new to the um, the planning game and only um, suffer the consequences of it rather than knowledge about how it's put together, is why um, it seems like that all of that study material that you presented there, um, is it comparable to other continuous footway environments such as the Netherlands, which 
I've got some experience of, um, and why, why fundamentally there's such a lot of difference and varying standards and no standards at all and some really, really shit infrastructure being put in um, almost like yesterday. Um, I don't fully understand where the blockage is and why and what we could do about that. Um, these studies are obviously um, adding to the knowledge uh, set around that, but where's the major blockage? Why is there no consistency? Um, yeah, that's, that's my main question. Uh, and I don't think I can provide provide all the answers. I mean, those those who are involved in doing the work are probably pulling their ha hair out in terms of that lack of um, lack of consistent design uh, design standards. I mean, the Netherlands is is a great one for coming up for nationwide de design standards um, in various things like traffic light systems in the UK. We have um different systems whereas in the um in the netherlands they have one system which means they can do um lots of lots of things consistently across the across the country so most of our guidance on this stuff um comes at a city level um and uh, one of the reasons this study um was with with transport scotland was because they they are able to come up with consistent guidelines for their nation um and so they just wanted to get go ahead and, and go ahead with that because they wanted to put more continuous footways in um, and currently the only guidance is in piecemeal in different uh, different different cities um, so, that, so they want to unify that across Scotland um, but currently in the the rest of the UK um, that design guidance is is at a, at a city city level so um, we've been working with with Bristol here in the here in the west of west of England, but hopefully um, studies like this can help inform design guidance. Whether we can move to a place in the future where that, that can be consolidated across the nation, um, I'm I'm not sure. But the Road Traffic Act and everything else is is a national um, um, the Highway Code and everything else is a fairly national approach to things. I dare say there's some differences between here in Scotland and um, the other devolved nations, but. Um, it seems like that there is such a such bad engineering infrastructure going in. If I was a chartered engineer and, and as a mechanical engineer, I'd be shot, let alone sacked, for putting some stuff in that's so bad that it's actually more dangerous than um, not using it at all. And I really can't understand why, I'm, I'm, as us as a pressure group collective, what can we do to, 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 um, to try and move that on, rather than just doing piecemeal city by city by city stuff, because that's clearly not working. Well, I suppose to, just taking the example of continuous footways, we, we do have to come up with evidence to show that in our, our context of the UK, um, that it, it works, it is safe, um, uh, it does, uh, does make it, um, improvements for um, for pe people using them we can't just take um, say design guidance from um, from Denmark or from from the Netherlands good as it might might be and say it will work in the in the UK context so we have to prove that first um, and then once we've proved it then we can uh, advocate that that's put in design guidance um, I'm afraid it's yeah. above, above my above my pay grade in terms of um, knocking heads together to have one design guidance across the country yeah i think i'll take that criticism as i've been involved in a lot of these things a lot more than jonathan is he's just telling me where we're going right or wrong i'm going to bring in like a there's a couple of hands up but i'm going to go to people that we haven't heard from today first because we've only got a couple of minutes left there and um, hopefully it'll be brief shane can i come in hi brian thanks thanks for bringing me in i've I have a political observation, then I have a technical question for Jonathan. And, and the political observation is that in the Netherlands, where continuous footways are being used, it's nearly always a low traffic neighborhood. It's nearly always a boundary around a low traffic neighborhood. And, and this is one of the key arguments for low traffic neighborhoods, is that if you put in a low traffic neighborhood, you're reducing the turning movements at the side roads and the volume of traffic at the side roads, which means you can put in the continuous footways. and I, I know people have seen it on social media that the, the argument is being made that the low traffic neighborhoods will make the boundary roads more dangerous 
And in fact, I argue the opposite, that low traffic neighborhoods will make the boundary roads safer because they're reducing the turning movements at the side roads. And then I, I have a question for Jonathan, which is, um, are you looking specifically at conflicts for cyclists who are cycling on the wrong side of the road? You had a couple of bi-directional cycle tracks there. And the one from Bradford, I think, when I saw that, I got a sharp intake of breath with the sight lines for the people coming from the wrong direction. And I just wonder, are you looking at that as part of this work? Thanks for letting me in there, Brian. Yeah, um, th th thanks. Just taking two of those. I mean, I, I totally agree with you in the in the Netherlands that um, continuous footways are used as that transition from uh, into neighborhood neighborhood areas, and that often involves um, point point closures or low traffic neighborhoods. But it's always that transition uh, marker between what uh, into the sort of um, residential areas. Um, in terms of the bi-directional, yes, we we are looking at that and. Um, but one interesting observation there is that, of course, we have unidirectional and bidirectional cycle tracks, but we always have bidirectional footways. Um, so we've looked at that as well. Uh, looked at that as well. That um, you, um, it, it's true, and there's been research from the Netherlands as, as well that um, on certain movements, vehicles coming out um, do uh, a higher high percentage of drivers do just look one way. Um, so that that happens, but of course pedestrians come both ways, um, and um, cyclists, in the case of a bi-directional um, cycle track, come both ways. So yes, it is is something we've looked at um, for both pedestrians and cyclists. I'm going to allow one quick one, but I've got to say as well that uh, Rachel Aldred's uh, latest research has shown that there's no like a uh, um, rising in injury risk on the perimeter roads of low traffic neighbourhoods. So that's that's a good one to quote to. Prove your hypothesis uh, there, Shane. Uh, Kate, do you want to come in? And then uh, we're nearly at the end. Yeah, it's Kate. a quick one. Um, yeah, yep. I'm interested. One of your junctions is um, Halsey Road in Bedford, where it's Kempston, but yeah, adjacent to Bedford. Um, TRL did a research, a, a study of that junction probably 20 years ago, because when that route that it was on went in, uh, for reasons known only to the rather eccentric engineer who designed it. One road had cyclists giving way to drivers, the second road had drivers giving way to cyclists, and the third road had everyone giving way to everybody. And there was concern that the inconsistency would result in, in a safety problem. And so TRL came out and did a, an observation study, and that was one of the three junctions they looked at. And their conclusion was, don't do it again, but it seems to be working, so leave it alone. So for what it's worth, that might be worth considering. Yeah, and certainly that's something that's um, come up is the the, um, the network for, uh, value. So if 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 um, like the what the example in Leeds is one of ten done in a similar style, and some of the others are, are, are one offs like that one in um, Bedford, where the styles on other junctions um, are, are different, and that certainly has a uh, an impact over over time in terms of how people get used to using them both as pedestrians, cyclists and, uh, and, and drivers. So the network effect is, is certainly an important one. All right, that's, that's great. We're going to leave it there, but I'm going to ask Steve like, to, to go back to like the politics. I'm going to do a quick poll just to see what the lay of the land is, and then we'll go over to Ruth for the last word. So uh, Steve, poll us up. There you, you go. Read that. What do we reckon? Getting better. <laughs> well, it's good to know these things, like a little drum roll. Almost there. Uh, any more votes? I'll say my local area in in Harper and North. Uh, one of the one of the people that was really campaigning for low traffic neighbours just just come in and swung from Conservative to Lib Dem, and they're really pushing it. So uh, I'm hoping things will work. Well, the local MP was quite into it, but we're, we're in the basket okay. case camp. I think we're there, Brian. I think virtually oh, everybody's... Yeah, go on then. It was just a fill in for time then. There you go. About the same. Mm. Well, there you go. There's a, there's a British poll. If <laughs> <ever I saw. laughs> Yeah. Grumble. All right, Ruth. And beat that with your last word. Okay. 
Um, well, it's a bit unfair because it's going to be a little, I'm going to be long but quick, as I always am, because Jonathan, I've wanted this for a long time about continuous pavements and um, continuous uh, footways. I have a theory that one of the problems we have here is our double yellow lines and our lining painting work, painting, because as soon as you draw the lines round, then it looks as though that's for the flow of traffic. And they don't have those. They certainly don't have them in Holland. I don't know about the rest of Europe. Um, the giveaway signs, we use, the, we use these shark's teeth but in the opposite way, which is counterintuitive because we're all used to giving way with a giveaway sign. And then because it's a raised table, they're painted the other way. And actually in your, a lot of your examples, you had both directions on one bit of road, which is, I think, very confusing. Um, tragically, a woman was killed in Richmond uh, a couple of weeks ago going on a shared use uh, cycleway pavement across the mouth of an athletics ground that people have been asking for a very long time. Uh, they shouldn't be able to drive out. And you've just made the point, the excellent point, that drivers should be looking both ways for pedestrians. So why not for cyclists? Young woman in her 40s, three children. I mean, shocking, absolutely shocking. Um, I don't know if Steve can get my picture up for me. I'm so Ruth, my, um, for some reason, my screen sharing, ironically, given that uh, I'm running. Oh, right. well, I'll have to show it next. Not week. working. OK, um, but the A406 uh, Gunnersbury Avenue is classic where there's a give way sign at every small junction of traffic in and out. And there is no reason why on the desire line it should not be a raised table and raised pavement straight across. And it would slow traffic down and... Um, you know, I think it'd be the best thing that we could possibly have. Thank you.